certainly a great privilege and a blessing to be back together. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know how blessed we are that you are here. We want you to know that you're welcome and wanted right here at West Hill. If you're looking for a church home and you're from the Navarra County or Corsicana area, that, that you are the person we want. We want you to talk with the elders and make this your home. Make West Hill your family. Certainly, if you're looking for a church family, there is no stronger or better people than those right here. We seek to do things here the Bible ways for Bible reasons. And we seek to please God. And if that's what you're about, then we want you to join with us. You know, we have, uh, we're, we're now in what, week six or seven of, of the football season. And, and we're, we're watching all of these games being played, and maybe you were watch some of them like uh, uh, Baylor and TCU yesterday, what, 119 points scored between both teams. That's almost like basketball scores, man. That's huge. And, and we see all of those, and we're reminded of some of those, those old cliches that we hear, things like uh, uh, the, the best offense is a good defense, for example. The idea that, uh, uh, you know, is a, if you really want to uh, play well, you want to make sure your defense plays well. I've even heard people say that defense wins championships. Certainly, we, we understand that concept, that defense is so important in, on a good team that it's eventually going to win championships. The armor of God that we have been engaged in, and, and I realize we kind of took a break because we moved out here, but... This last one, the armor of God that we've been engaged in a study in for some time is basically about defense. Think about it. The breastplate is about defense. The helmet is about defense. Even the shoes were about protecting the, the, the feet from the elements in the environment. It was about defense. The above all else, this shield of faith is about defense. But do you know what you get when you have a great, great defense and no offense at all? Have you ever thought about that? You get a tie. Zero, zero. You know, God means for us to be a victorious people. He tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who has loved us. Jesus is more to us than just one who loves us, but He is the one who has promised to us a great victory. Not only are we going to be victorious, but he says we are more than conquerors. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, he tells us that, that uh, uh, he has made us victorious through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 2, chapters 2 and 3, when Jesus is, is writing through John these letters to the seven churches of Asia, it's interesting, to every one of those churches, he makes this statement, to the one who conquers, and then there's a blessing associated with it. To each one of them. To the one who conquers, or some translations, to the one who overcomes. Because this is the truth. God has designed us to be victorious. God is on our side rooting for us to be the winners in this great spiritual conflict. And God empowers us that we would be able to be victorious. And if God wants us to be winners, brethren, why would we ever settle for a stalemate? We are not in a standoff with the devil. We are in a face-off with the devil. And we need to, to fight be, like we intend to win. You know, sometimes... Uh, uh, we, we, we look at the armor of God and we think, well, you know, this is about a defensive strategy. And in a, in a lot of ways, it is about a defensive strategy. Most of the parts of the armor are about us defending ourselves against the attacks which the devil brings against us. But after spending most of his time on these defensive strategies, he shifts gears and he says, but you have a weapon. In our current age of, of tolerance... And let's, let's get along with everybody. We've, we've kind of stopped talking about Christians' attacks. That's what the sword is for. 
Yeah, I suppose we could sit here and say that at some point the sword serves as a defensive weapon. You know, when someone is striking or slashing, you can certainly block or deflect a blade. But the sword initially is about attacking. People say, well, 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 Christianity, we're supposed to be a religion of peace. Well, we are peace, but we're misunderstanding the idea of peace there and the idea of war. Our attacks are not against flesh and blood. We already know that from this account of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic power over this present darkness and the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We have an appropriate enemy. And if we say, but yes, we're a religion of peace, we don't attack, then we fail to understand what peace is that passes all understanding. And we fail also to understand what God's attacks are. People who say that we are not a religion of attacks, I think they misunderstand also uh, uh, how we are to behave in this world. You know, people look and they say, well, well, we don't want to be labeled as crusaders. We don't want to be labeled as jihadist. We don't want to be lumped together with those who are instigators and agitators of this world. But you know, if we are living our lives the way that God has commanded us to live, that is, if we are living righteously and godly in this present world, that is an offense to the world itself. We can't be at peace with the world and its vices. We cannot be at peace with the ways of the world that leads so many to spiritual destruction. We have to be aggravated and fight against those ways which threaten God's ways. While we defend the moral high ground, God wants us to go on the defensive with the sword. This morning we're going to look quickly at the sword, three areas, its purpose, its power, and its practice. Let's start with the purpose of the sword itself. The spirit's sword is here to discern thoughts and tents of the heart. One of the well-known verses of Hebrews chapter 4 is verse 12, after he's been talking about the rest which God gives us. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you rest. I want you to enter into the rest which I have promised you. In the first 11 verses of chapter 4, I think he mentions that rest uh, 11 times. Almost every verse mentions it, and some of them mention it twice. But he says that, that the, the Word of God is, is living and is powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword. And what does it do? It, 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 it's, it's through the piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, the joints and the marrow, it, it discerning the, the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. We, we look at this sword and we're amazed by its power. We, we think about swords. Most of the time you take a sword, it, it's about piercing someone and wounding them so that those wounds become an injury and lead to death. In contrast, the sword of the Spirit pierces us through and it doesn't cause wounds, it causes healing. And when brought to fruition, doesn't bring death, but it brings life. It's a little bit different. Our sword is different from the sword that man would wield, from the sword that mankind has. This is a living sword, not a dying sword. It brings life and not death. It is active. It is, that, that, that means that, that it has a continual action in it. It's not something that lies dormant on a coffee table. It's not something that is best used sliding into the bookcase. It's not something that, that reaches its full potentials on, on, the, on the dashboard of the truck or underneath the seat. It is something that must be active, that is used over and over and over again. To gain its greatest benefits, we must embrace the activity of the Word of God. And he says it is sharper. It is honed by the Spirit Himself. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. The edge of the sword was for cutting. It was, it was, the point was for piercing. He says that it is, it's, to, it's to divide the soul and the, and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It, it's, it, it, it is to, to drive deep into a person's life and to make changes, to discern 
between the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That is to discern good and evil in the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The Spirit's sword is a discerning of righteousness. We, we would add to that that the Spirit's sword is a, a killing weapon in a sense, even though he says here it is living, uh, we understand that it has a killing power that targets the old man of sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, the old man of sin is to be crucified. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. That sword of the Spirit, that Word of God, drives deep into our hearts and our spirits, and it is targeting the old man of sin, seeking to kill it, to cut it out. On the other hand, it is, it is seeking also to kill even residual sin in our lives as Christians. When we say we have no sins, we are liars and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1 and verse 8. So what do we do about the sin that is in us? Colossians 3 and verse 5 says, But put to death, or literally murder, your members which are upon the earth. And he goes into a list of the works of the flesh in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and following. This Word of God, this Bible that we read and that we study, it drives into our heart and pierces and kills that sin that resides within us. The Spirit's word is, 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 is a, a piercing instrument. Remember in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 37, they were, they were pricked in their hearts and they asked, Men and brethren, what must we do? Peter had just told them, Let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus, whom you have crucified, the Lord has made him both God has made him both Lord and Christ. But you killed him. You put him to death. And they were pained by their sin. Their guilt began to press upon them and weigh upon them like a ton of bricks. And they said, what shall we do? Because they were pierced in their heart. That's what the Word of God does. It drives into the very core of our human spirit, engages us on the deepest level of who we are. Acts chapter 5 and verse 33, again, as, as Peter and, and John were, were dealing with the Sanhedrin council, it says that they, the, the ESV says, they were enraged. The actual Greek word is, they were cut to the heart. Again, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 54, when, when Stephen is preaching the great history of, of the, the Jewish religion to bring them to the point that this Jesus was the Christ, when he makes that final conclusion, those who are listening to him are, are enraged. They rush upon him. They begin to bite him even. That word enraged, again, is that, that word cut to the heart. The word of God pierces to the deepest part of us. That is its purpose. We, we don't keep the sword in its scabbard and whack people over the head with it. We draw it from its resting place and we drive it into the hearts of mankind because it must be drawn, it must be swinging in order to be living and active and do what God has called for it to do. That's the purpose of the sword. Now, in order for it to accomplish that purpose, we need to be practicing with the Word. Think about the idea of practice and how practice makes perfect, right? You play like you practice, a coach will say. The more we practice, the more efficient we get at, at, at accomplishing our goals. A lineman blocks better when he practices. The running backs run better when they practice. The hunter hits his mark more often when he practices ahead of time. Practice makes perfect. But how do we practice with this word? What does it mean to practice with the sword of the Spirit? Well, I think obviously we come to 2 Timothy 2.15, where the Bible tells us to, to do our best to present ourselves to God as, as one that does not need to be ashamed. Doing right. Uh, we, we need to be rightly dividing or handling aright the Word of God. 
There's a right way to handle this Bible. A few years ago, a friend of mine was preaching out in Rising Star, Texas. And Julie and I and, and the babies, were, they, 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 I'm not even sure David was born at that point, but Jason was a little baby. And we went out there, and this, this particular preacher, he was, he was into, uh, uh, you know, all the martial arts and karate and stuff. And uh, he had a sword. And uh, I, said, I said, I want to play with your sword. And he said, no, it's dangerous. I said, I'm a grown man. I can play with a sword. You know, this is like one of those katana ninja swords, you know. And I was, I was just itching to get my hands on it. He wouldn't even let me pick it up. And uh, he had a cowboy hat, and I was kind of goofing when I was wearing this hat. And, and he, he hands me this wooden sword. He said, here, play with this. If you, can, if you can handle it, you know, then I'll let you play with my other sword. And so I'm swinging around like an idiot, and I hit the hat off my head and put a big dent in the side of his hat. He said something about, isn't it a good thing you weren't playing with a real sword? And uh, I realized then, I can't handle a sword. God didn't give me a sword. I have not practiced with it. Now, I'm sure if I, if I learned how to handle a sword and had some practice and things like that, that's one thing. But if you pick it up and you're just goofing off, you're not ready to handle this word. Paul says, you've got to do your best. Some translations say, you have got to give diligence. Other translations say, study to show yourself approved. We've got to spend time with the Word by studying in order to practice with it. So that we may gain the ability to do what God wants us to do. Secondly, I'd say that we need to be reading it. And you say, well, reading and studying are the same thing. Well, they're not really the same thing. Studying is about breaking down and, and taking piece by piece and understanding why this word fits with this word and what it is that God wants us to do. It is about more than just reading the text. But, but he tells us, blessed are those who read this word aloud. If we will just take the word and read through it, there is great value in just, even in just reading the word. Now, reading without study is obviously not very, very good. We need to read and study. Study without reading, sometimes we miss the entirety of the whole. It's not good. We need to study and read. And then we need to meditate. We need to spend time allowing that word to work itself into our minds and into our hearts, allowing it to, to come out of our hands and our mouth and our speech. Oh, how I love the law. It is my meditation all the day. It's what I think about. You know, when you think about something over and over, it, 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 it is like that worm that, 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 that buries itself deep inside. And what better worm is there to have than the worm of God's Word resting in my heart, wiggling around, and expressing itself in my everyday life? so that the hands that I use to reach out to those around me are controlled by the Word of God, so that the, the heart which people sees with which I interacted with them, that, that it is controlled by the Word of God. My words are controlled by the Word of God. My thoughts are controlled by the Word of God. My actions, where I go, how I treat people, are all controlled by the Word of God because it has pierced its way into my heart and I have practiced with it deeply and spending time so that I can change the world around me. And then finally, there is a power in the Word. While practice and experience, I would tell us, gives us a great advantage in the use of the Word, the true power of the Word isn't because I am so adept at it. It isn't because I know just the right words to speak. It isn't me. The true power of the Word is its origin. It is the sword of the Spirit. Now, all along these different articles of the, the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness... We say that the breastplate is made up of righteousness. The helmet of salvation that we put upon our head is made up of salvation. We might be tempted to say the sword of the Spirit then means that the sword is made of the Spirit. 
But this is the first time that the, the grammar actually changes here. And it means the sword that is granted by the Spirit. It is what the Spirit has given. And I look at that phrase, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I'm reminded, number one, that the Spirit has a weapon. Oftentimes we see pictures of Jesus that have been painted, an artist's rendition. And Jesus is there playing with the lambs. Or Jesus is there only holding the children. And we see him only in those moments of peace and tranquility. And sometimes we forget that he cleansed the temple not once but twice, driving them out with a cat of nine tails. We see Jesus angry at times. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! The Spirit, likewise, carries a weapon. We depict him as the dove, but he's more than just the dove. He is a war hawk. Seeking to take the old man of sin away and crucify him. So that the new creature may remain with him. The Spirit not only has a weapon, but I would say this, the Spirit has only one weapon, and it is His Word. And it's what He has given to mankind because the Spirit has made it His sword and He hands it to us. And this, this Word does not come by private interpretation, we're told, in 2, 2 Peter 1 and verse 21. But holy men spoke as they were borne along by the Spirit of God. The Spirit has created this sword, this word that He has given to us. The Spirit hones its edge. We said that the, the, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. But I'm not the one who keeps its edge. The Spirit keeps its edge, sharp and ready to use. It is the Spirit who trains us in its use. John 14 and 26, He shall guide you into all truth, bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We take this Word and we study it. We take it into our heart and we prepare to go out into the world and change the world with it. And our promise is, when we do that, it has the power to accomplish what it is set out to do. Not because of me, but because it's origin from the Spirit. Our ability to defeat the enemy... To wound hearts with the life-giving word depends upon us trusting God's word to accomplish its power. I think of Isaiah 55 and verse 11 when he says, that, So shall my word uh, be that goes out from my mouth. The, things that, the words which I speak that go out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, or some translations say void, without value, having accomplished nothing. It shall not return unto me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The Word has a power, and that power is God Himself. And so as the battle rages over the souls of men, God wants us to be victorious. He doesn't want us to end in a tie. He doesn't just want great defense. He wants our offense to be there as well. With the sword of the Spirit. Winning not only, securing not only salvation for ourselves, but winning salvation for those around us. Right now, we face an enemy that we must defeat. <laughs> we hear that phrase, failure is not an option. Nowhere is that more true than with God Himself. Than the, the realm of spirituality. Failure is not an option for us. For failure is an eternity in hell. But you have an opportunity this morning, we all do. Take hold of eternal life. Draw that sword of the Spirit. And we may not be drawing it from the scabbard this morning. If you're not a Christian, you may be drawing the sword from your very heart. And hold it in your hand. And ready to go. If you're ready to obey His gospel in this moment when we, we sing this song of invitation... Please come forward. We want to baptize you for the remission of your sins. We want to help you draw the sword from your own heart so that you may go into the world and change the lives of others. And if you're here and you're a child of God and maybe you've just backslidden a little bit, you feel weak, weary, battle-worn,
want to be rejuvenated, then by all means, the encouragement of the church here is what you need. If we can help you in some way, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?